In this session, we're going to discuss fasting. Firstly, what is biblical fasting? Fasting, what does that look like? Biblical fasting is a deliberate abstention from food for spiritual purposes. This may be as a religious observance at particular times of the year, as we read in the Old Testament, or it may be to seek the mind of the Lord on any particular matter or circumstance which has come to hand. For instance, you may want to be, uh, you may be in a place where you want direction from God, and it's a good thing uh, to fast. So, what does fasting then involve? Leviticus uh, chapter 16 verses 29 to 31 says, Afflict your souls. In fasting, there is a denial of the flesh. And it's necessary to note that to fast does not exclude the drinking of water unless you receive specific direction to do so. The scripture says of Moses that he either ate food nor drank water for 40 days. We read that in Exodus chapter 34, verse 28. Now, if you drink coffee or tea during a fast, you're drinking a stimulant, and therefore the fast may be termed only a partial fast. It is usual to drink water only during a fast. If one decides not to drink water, this should be restricted to a period no longer than three days, unless, as we have stated, one has specific direction. Esther commanded a fast for her people of three days without food or water. And we can read that in the book of Esther, uh, chapter 4, verse 16. And the reason that we say that you should not go without water for any longer than three days, because three days is the average length of time that a person may, or the minimum uh, length of time a person can go without water. Different people react differently to that. So the third thing that we want to talk about this morning is the body's reaction to fasting. A fast will in no way injure your health if conducted properly. In fact, it will be beneficial for your body. For the first day, few days of a fast, one is likely to feel quite weak, but strength will return as the fast continues. When a few meals are missed, stomach pains are frequently felt. This is the body's response for the appetite to be satisfied. In fact, your stomach is beginning to shrink. However, true hunger does not begin until all the waste tissue is used up. A headache may be evident on the first afternoon of a fast. That's often due to the effect of stimulants, e.g. caffeine in the body or of sugars present because of improper eating or drinking habits. So just understand that these things uh, will occur once you give yourself to fasting. There's no need for alarm. Just let me say this, that headaches or bad breath or a slight fever, as these are the results of the oxidizing of waste materials which are in your body. And this is why it is essential to drink a lot of water to help eliminate the body's waste materials. So this is this just not only has a spiritual uh, value to it, but it also is of immense physical value to your bodies. So what about the spiritual value of fasting? Let's look at that. The first thing is that there is an example set by us in the, in the Word, and, and Jesus is our highest authority. And so in Matthew uh, chapter 4, verse 2, Jesus says this, And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Well, that's what Matthew is saying about Jesus. Uh, and after his temptation in the wilderness. He says he was afterward hungry. It would appear that Jesus drank, therefore, during this fast. This is the first thing that one would feel after a fast of such duration is not principally hunger, but thirst. In Matthew 6, 16 to 18, uh, we find very clearly that Jesus says, Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites. So, when you fast, uh, that seems to suggest that Jesus was expecting 
his disciples to fast. You see, he did it himself, so we would expect some spiritual benefit from doing it also. And uh, as he was in the world, so should we be. Jesus fasted, set an example for the disciples. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus deals with three things, all expected of the believer, the giving of alms, prayer and fasting. Furthermore, Jesus has promised the reward to uh, the reward of the Father for those who fast. So in Matthew 6 and verse 18, we read this, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So there is a value and there is a reward and we would expect that reward of the Father to come in our um, having an answer to the very things that we are fasting about. The second thing is that uh, fasting does impart power and I think that this is important for us. In, in Matthew uh, 25 to 29, we read these verses. And when Jesus saw that the people were running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. And the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that they said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and he um, lifted him up and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast out the demon? And he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but by prayer and fasting. This type comes out by nothing but prayer and fasting. It's the verse 29. You see, the di disciples had genuinely uh, tried to heal this boy. They had uh, tried to cast the demon out, but no result. This no doubt brought some real embarrassment and confusion to them, particularly as the twelve had experienced such power over devils and sickness when they had previously been sent out two by two and we read of that in Mark chapter 6 7 to 13. And you'll note there that Jesus sent them out two by two with very specific instructions uh, to preach the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of the kingdom was the good news of that the Messiah had come and that uh, there was healing in his name and deliverance in his name. But Jesus' response to their inability to cast out the spirit was this, that it could only be cast out through prayer and fasting. So then, the third thing about prayer and fasting is that it brings out direction from God. Well, so we need what we need direction, don't we? And there are times when we need to be listening to him. But very often immediately that the fast is over, one may not have immediate direction from God. You immediately look for it and you say, Where is it? Uh, but sometimes it will sometimes it can take a little while to unfold. However, one thing that we do know is the scripture says that he is, that's God. He is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him and he will make his way uh, clear to you. That, that is absolutely certain. You know, in the life of the church, however, we may well, may well expect an immediate answer or, or, or close immediacy, let me put it that way. In Acts uh, chapter 13, verses 1 to 3, we see that the teachers and the prophets were gathered together at the church of Antioch and they, they prayed and they fasted. And in this period of time, the Lord spoke <coughs> through one of them to send out missionaries uh, to the Gentile areas. 
And a great work of God followed as a result of this direction. And this is what we uh, can expect, that when God directs through the prophetic, now, it's an interesting passage of scripture there because it tells us that they, having received direction, they prayed and they fasted, continued to pray and fast for a couple of days, seeking uh, the confirmation of that. And, and once they knew that this is definitely what God was saying, they sent out Saul and Barnabas for the work that he had been called to. One thing that we definitely see, um, and this is the fourth thing I want to talk about, it moves the hand of God. And in Daniel uh, chapter 9, verses 2 to 4, we see that in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Goes on and says, Then I set my face toward the Lord to make request by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and uh, awesome God, who keeps the covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. So here's, here's Daniel and he's been reading the book of Jeremiah and he's understanding that Jeremiah had prophesied that Judea, that Judea would be in captivity for a period of 70 years and then he would return them back to the land. And uh, this is 68 years on after the captivity. So he, he, he wants to know more about God's involvement in this. And so he gives himself to prayer and to uh, supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. You see, this was his response to the word of God. And uh, uh, there's a couple of other verses there that we should notice out of Daniel chapter 9, verses 20, 23. And now while I was speaking, praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God and the holy mountain of my uh, and the holy mountain of my God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening sacrifice. That's three o'clock in the afternoon. And he uh, informed me and he talked with me and he said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand at the beginning of your supplications the command went out and I have come to tell you for you are greatly beloved therefore consider the matter and understand the vision well God was certainly at work wasn't he uh, in Daniel's time of prayer and fasting and we see that God moved to answer in response to this time of prayer and fasting and in Jan Daniel chapter 10, we find Daniel had been fasting for a full three weeks without answer. And it was on the 24th day that he receives this heavenly vision of Gabriel. And note that the answer also was hindered uh, by God, um, was hindered rather by Satan, and that God had to send the archangel Michael to assist Gabriel because she was hindered by the prince of the power of the air over Persia and so God gave assistance to Gabriel to bring the answer to Daniel how awesome is that that the God intervened in such a way because he needed Daniel to know uh, certain things pertinent uh, to the future and so we see that there is this moving of the hand of God. And uh, he says this, O oh Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. That's Daniel. 
How great is that? And uh, so the, another thing that we need to understand is this, that um, it cleanses. It cleanses. The often fasting can be accompanied by weeping and mourning and the confession of sins as God speaks to a person's heart. So let us very clearly understand that God speaks, God wants to speak and he will speak. And God speaks. And that's what David said in 9, 4, O Lord, great and awesome God, he keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and those who keep his commandments. God moves on your account. Let us not forget that. Now, fasting, let me say this, it's individual as well as a collective. And so, um, and uh, we see Daniel has a, as a person, as an individual, receives an, a response from God. He says, then I set my face toward the Lord to make request by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth and ashes. And we also see David in Psalm 35, verse 13, another individual, um, and he says this, but as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth and I humbled myself with fasting and my prayer would return to my own heart. Notice that he utilized fasting. Well, we've already mentioned collectively the church at Antioch and Acts 13. And in, in verse two of Acts 13, we, it, it says this, and they ministered to the Lord, and as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them to. Very direct direction. And then of course, uh, in Matthew uh, 9, uh, 14, uh, we see further fasting. So this brings us to how should I fast? How should I fast? The Pharisees made a practice of fasting twice a week. And uh, in 9.14, uh, this tells us the disciples of John came to him saying, Why do we and the Pharisees uh, fast often? but your disciples do not fast. Interesting, isn't it? <laughs> but your disciples do not fast. What we find is that the uh, Pharisees of Old Testament times and uh, coming into the, our New Testament times, they actually fasted Mondays and Thursdays. But the early church fathers, they fasted Wednesdays and Fridays. So. We see this consistently amongst believers in the early um, history of the church. We see it in Judaism as well. But the Bible does not say, let me say this, we must fast, nor does it specify the frequency that we fast. But uh, from the Sermon on the Mount and other passages, we see Jesus understood that we would fast. No doubt about it. He understood that we would. And if he understood that we would, then it uh, behoves us to move in that specific direction when we're looking for answers. Uh, so in Matthew 5, 6 to 7, we read, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. All right. How do I break a fast? This is, I think, is important, and we need to discuss this uh, momentarily, because... Fasting, whilst fasting is important, the way we break a fast is just as important. So the general principle is that uh, you, you take as long to break a fast as you were on the fast. 
So you shouldn't, at the end of a fast, say you've been fasting three or four days, then gorge heavy foods the day you break it. You should break it uh, firstly with fruit juices, nothing heavy like milk, uh, then maybe soups, uh, light soups and light foods. This is necessary uh, for your physical welfare and as well as to receive the maximum spiritual benefit of it. It's sometimes the body can react uh, horribly if you begin gorging heavy foods at the end of a fast. So some people say, well, am I ever too old to fast? No, look, consider Anna the prophetess who was 84 years old when Jesus was brought to the temple to be circumcised. And in Luke 2, uh, verses 36 to 37, we read this. Now there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple, but served God. Listen now but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. How about that? She was a consistent faster. And uh, Daniel, when he began his, fa his fast, you know, <laughs> he was 90 years old. He fasted for a full three weeks in Daniel 10, verse 3. He said, I had no pleasant food, no meat or wine came into my mouth nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. So <clears throat> Anna was 84 and had a life of constant fasting. Daniel at 90s says, I need to lose some weight. No, he says, look, I've got to give myself to prayer and fasting because I see that uh, God has something to say and something to do and my people have been in captivity now uh, for uh, 68 years and there's another two years to go as determined by the prophet Jeremiah. So he set his face to prayer and supplication before the living God and uh, it was, it's interesting because if you go on and read uh, Daniel 10, uh, what you see is that the Archangel Gabriel has a very special uh, message for him and it concerns the time of the ages in which he's living and it concerns also the time of the coming of Messiah. So he had special revelation pertinent to his people, the return of his people uh, to the land of Judea because God needed to establish that land, that people again, in order to bring through the, the uh, Messiah. And uh, so it was very, very special time for Daniel. So God bless you, and I hope it will be a special time for you too, when you uh, give yourself to prayer and to fasting as you seek the mind and the face of the Lord. So I trust that this study today will be of some help and assistance to you. God bless you.